Greetings and welcome to Engaging Religious Audiences for Social Change. This virtual event is focusing on how anti-racism is addressed in religious context by highlighting the work of folks engaged in this often undervalued form of public scholarship. We hope to better understand the patterns, practice, and challenges associated with influencing and perpetuating social justice and religious communities. My name is Keenan Colquitt. I'm the program lead for the Diversity Scholars Network, which is a core initiative in the National Center for Institutional Diversity, the Diversity Scholars Network. The Diversity Scholars Network is a scholarly community committed to advancing understandings of historical and contemporary social issues related to identity, difference, cultural representation, power, oppression, and inequality as they occur and affect individuals, groups, and communities and institutions. We are proud to sponsor this program in collaboration with NCID's Anti-Racism Racism Collaborative, a strategic space for engagement around anti-racism research and scholarship and part of the Provost Anti-Racism Initiative. On behalf of the Diversity Scholars Network and the Anti-Racism Collaborative, we welcome you. We begin this presentation with a land acknowledgement. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Three Fires Confederacy made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially as a gift through the treaty at the foot of the rapids. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few reminders with you all. Live closed captioning is available. Click on the CC icon and select view subtitle. The session is being recorded and will be available on NCID's website following the session. A transcript will be provided on the website with events recording. Please submit questions using the Q&A tool and the Zoom toolbar. Engage this topic online with hashtag NCID anti-racism and follow us on Twitter at UMish NCID. Please help us build this Diversity Scholars Network program and other anti-racism collaborative initiatives by completing our post-event survey displayed in your browser immediately after the discussion ends. More information about the DSN is available on our website. Now to our panelists. Dr. Samira Mehta. Dr. Mehta is a assistant professor of women and gender studies, Jewish studies. Her research and teaching focus on the intersections of religion, culture, and gender, including politics of family life and reproduction in the United States. Her first, her first book, Beyond Chrismica, the Christian Jewish Blended Family in America was a National Jewish Book Award finalist. Meta's current project, God Bless the Pill, Sexuality, Contraception, and the American Religion, examines the role of Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant voices in competing moral logics of contraception, population control, eugenics, from the mid 20th century to the present. Meta has just received a grant from the Henry Luke uh, Foundation uh, for a three-year initiative called Jews of Color, Histories and Futures. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Meta. Dr. Matthew Pressler. Dr. Pressler is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the College of Charleston. He is the author of Authentically Black and Truly Catholic, The Rise of the Black Catholicism in the Great Migrations, and is currently working on a uh, history of white Catholic, uh, Catholic racism in the 20th century. He has written for the uh, Atlantic, uh, Slate, American, uh, Sotelo, Public uh, Square, and Religion News Services. Together with Andrew M. Banks, he co-wrote the award-winning Religious News Service series Beyond Most Segregated Hours. He is also a member of the Charleston Area Justice Ministry, a grassroots collaboration of more than 30 congregations coming together to make the low county a place that is just and equitable for all. Dr. Kressler. 
Dr. Eric Barreto. Dr. Barreto is a Frederick and Margaret L. Weinsinger, Associate Professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary. He is the author of Ethnic Negotiations, the Function of Race and Ethnicity and Arts 16, and Acts 16, excuse me, and the co-author of Exploring the Bible. As a Baptist minister, Barreto has pursued scholarship for the sake of the church, and he regularly writes for and teaches in faith communities around the country. He is also, he is also a leader in the Hispanic Theological Initiative uh, Consortium, an organization comprised of some of the top seminaries, theological schools, and religion departments in the country. Dr. Rado. And Dr. Nancy Kelly uh, is an anthropologist and assistant professor of American culture in the University of Michigan and a 2018 LSA Collegiate Fellow, American Culture. Her forthcoming book, Moms of US, under contract with Stanford University Press, is based on a multi year research project of Islamic Higher Education Institute and religious clerks or imams in the US. Her project uh, argues that ethnographic, eth ethnographically uh, depicts how bureaucratic policies such as visa offerings and approval and state led higher education degree granting authority can shape how decentralized religions regulate. Uh, credential and recognize their religious leaders and institutions in the United States. Dr. Khalil. And now our moderator, uh, Dr. Melissa Morha. Dr. Morha is a 2022 Anti-Racism Collaborative Research Community Impact Fellow and Assistant Professor in the Department of American Culture at the University of Michigan. She, re she researches migration and religion, politics, race, ethnicity in the United States and the Pacific world, with special attention to how Asian American religion beliefs and practices have developed in the context of pluralism, migration, and the modern American state. Her book, Follow the New Way, American Refugee Resettlement Policy and uh, Hmong a Religious Change, uh, draws on uh, oral history and archival research to instigate the religious dimensions of American refugee care how governments have expanded capacity through partnerships with religions, uh, organizations, and how refugee policies have shaped our religious lives and refugees. So Dr. Borja, as the moderator, I'll turn over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Colquitt. Thank you to the National Center for Institutional Diversity for hosting and planning this wonderful event. And thank you everybody who is here today to listen to this conversation. If you're a panelist, participate in this conversation. I sincerely hope that we have a chance to share ideas and that we all walk away with better ideas about how to do our work more effectively. So this event, is about engaging religious audiences for social change. And the first theme I want to discuss is this. What exactly is the role of religious communities in building a more just and equitable society? Now, religious communities can maintain the status quo in powerful ways. A look at the past reveals that religious communities have defended slavery, supported immigration restrictions and exclusions, upheld white supremacy, denied climate change, advanced nationalism, and much more. But we also know that religious communities can be important sites for impactful social change. Religious communities were involved in the freedom struggles and civil rights activism of the 1950s and 60s, the sanctuary movement of the 1980s, the refugee advocacy efforts, and Reverend William Barber's Poor People Campaign in the current moment. So we have a wonderful group of scholars who have a variety of different um, types of expertise on this very topic. And I wanna begin with this question. What are some specific examples of religious communities serving as sites for impactful social change? And I invite our panelists to draw on their research as well as their personal observations as they reflect on this question. So why don't I begin with you, Matt Kressler. Uh, what would you like to say on this topic? Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here in conversation with such brilliant people. 
Um, so I think that for most people hearing the question about how do religious communities engage in social change, I think most Americans would probably immediately think of the civil rights era. Um, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, you know, we think back to that moment as a kind of signal moment where religious communities were mobilizing for social change, um, particularly Christian, Black Christian and Muslim communities. Um, but I'm, so you were kind of noting the different hats that we wear. One of the hats, the primary hat I wear as a teacher and scholar is as a historian of Africana religions. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that this has kind of been the story of Africana religions from the moment that enslaved Africans were brought to what would become the United States. So if we think of um, the Stono Rebellion, uh, a, an enslaved uprising um, in the early 18th century, that was led by Congolese Catholics who were enslaved here in Charleston. We think of Nat Turner, you know, Nat Turner was an African-American apocalyptic prophet who launched a slave uprising, right? Um, and we could kind of go out, go, go on down the line. Um, but if we're thinking about black religious history in the United States, um, religious communities are often, not always, not kind of inherently or innately, but they're often sites of social change. And I think that, you know, if we think about the Mother Emanuel massacre here in Charleston back in 2015, you know, this historical fact is why white religious communities are often targets for, um, white supremacist violence um, and action. Um, I could continue, uh, but I'm gonna uh, pause here and, and invite some of my other colleagues to jump in. So I think that, you know, one of the interesting questions is what motivates people to work for social justice and social change and why? And so I am, a scholar of American Judaism, sort of in conversation usually with Protest American Protestantism and Catholicism, but for a moment I'm going to speak as a scholar of American Judaism and as someone who does a lot of my own social justice work through the Jewish community. Um, and for, for Jews, there's this real sense of being motivated by a history of anti-Semitism. Some of the time that is um, social justice work on behalf of and for the Jewish community. And sometimes that history and that motivation prompts American Jews to participate in other social justice movements. So for instance, um, and, and it's important to note, and I can say more about this later, that this can cut both ways, right? So between 1880 and 1924, the number of Jews in the United States skyrockets from not really a notable percentage of the population to the point where there are more Jews in New York City than there are really anywhere else in the world. And um, and the people who were already here, the American Jews who were already here really wanted to help out those new immigrant populations. And help out meant helping them succeed in American society and sometimes came from the best impulses. And sometimes it meant like we find them embarrassing and we want to get them on board with how it is that we are. Right, so it's important to remember like what counts as social justice can cut both ways. Um, so there's that piece, but there's also a very real piece in American Judaism, this sense that like we we have been hurt by oppression. Um, we are the, the victims of what, um, and this is not sort of an inherent word to the Jewish community, but what scholars like Kiati Joshi call white Christian supremacy. Um, so for instance, the Holocaust, right, to use sort of the big guns example, is a moment of Jews being harmed by white supremacy and therefore we must be in alliance with others. Um, that is really a massive piece of the Jewish motivation to participate in something like the civil rights movement. This sense that as a, as, um, a religious group for whom persecution is central to, their, to the story, um, we must do this in alliance, not only for ourselves, for, but for others. And that sometimes gets done at real risk. I went to graduate school in Atlanta and um, the temple bombing, which you may know if I'm gonna date myself, but it's in the movie Driving Miss Daisy, um, <clears throat> occurs because there's an interfaith, interracial prayer breakfast there. It's not the first one, it's the, sort of the white supremacists can't quite get themselves to bomb a white Christian church, but they can bomb a synagogue for doing this, right? So it's not the first of these prayer breakfasts, but it's the place where there's a bombing. Um, if, for instance, to think of a more contemporary example, the Squirrel Hill 
shooting um, was in part prompted by alliances with Hayas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, and their work on resettling um, refugees in that moment, I believe, largely from Syria. Um, and in fact, one of the primary groups that came to the support of that community was the Islamic Federation of Pittsburgh, not like because they already had this close working relationship. So, you know, this sense of, of one's own persecution and um, the need to both fight against that and to fight as good allies in coalition is really, for many people in the Jewish community, a very strong mandate. Thank you for that. So it, it seems that um, that history is really very present in shaping how people are moving through the world and responding to injustices in the current moment. Now look, look at this on the other side. We don't, we know that religious communities are not always uh, involved in social change in a way that is, um, I think perhaps we could say positive. Uh, so the examples I gave at the very top of the conversation are a few salient instances of that. So my question is this, what stands in the way of religious communities being involved in justice work? I'd love to hear some specific examples either from research or, or personal observation. Why don't you um, begin, Eric? Thanks, y'all. Uh, three three uh, obstacles that I think um, I'm imagining here. The first is that I think, especially when it comes to communities that are privileged in some significant way in our culture, those religious communities tend to be homogeneous around race, social class, politics, and identity. So often these places, not all of them, but many places can be ideological silos where the problems of marginalized communities may not reach the, the attention of folks in these communities, of people who look or are sitting next to them on a pew on Sunday morning, look like them, think like them, have a life like them. Uh, and second, and related to, the, to that then, is that there are certain communities, and I think here I'm thinking about Christian communities in particular, that can nurture a narrow imagination about who counts as a neighbor. Um, it runs contrary to Christian teaching, but there are ways in which uh, misformed theologies, misformed imaginations will nurture in people a sense, a, a, a narrow sense of who counts as a neighbor and who counts as somebody who we don't have to worry about as much. But I think mo the most important thing, the thing I've experienced most in, in, in the teaching I've done, in, especially in, in Christian churches, is that in a lot of these communities, it's not often a lack of will. It's not that they don't want to, uh, but often that they don't want to get it wrong. They know, you know, in these Christian communities that when politics and advocacy mix, sometimes things go awry. So they're worried about that. But they also worry that they know that there's stuff they don't know. They don't know where to start, and they don't know what the work might look like for them. They know what it, what, what it should look like for them, but positive examples, I think, are sometimes more fleeting. So this is one place where public scholarship could be so helpful uh, in this work. If we as scholars can help these churches understand the wider historical context uh, of their local communities, for example, of, or how, how is it that this uh, community of faith has reach the kind of privilege that it has. We can provide that historical context as a backing, but also we can also provide theological and scriptural resources to help these communities imagine this work not as additional or secondary or tertiary parts of faithfulness, but at the very heartbeat of what it means to be a person of faith, a religious person. You know, I really like the way that Eric talked about um, sort of what it is that, how your imagination is shaped. Um, I talked about the ways in which experiences of white Christian supremacy really um, sort of shape the Jewish imagination in ways that give it a passion for justice. I think that it does um, sort of two things as well. There are three points that I want to raise, but I think two of them tie to the, this white Christian supremacy piece. The first is that that experience can create fear right? Remember that I gave the example of the temple bombing. That wasn't the first interfaith interracial prayer breakfast. It was, however, the one that could get bombed. So the Jewish community now is rightfully very proud of being disproportionately represented in the civil rights movement. So if you think of the number of white people who were involved 
a higher percentage of those people are Jewish than is of the white American population. But it was a really small percentage of American Jews who were involved. People were scared. They were scared because they're more vulnerable, right, than like the white Presbyterian church that they collaborate with because of the realities of anti-Semitism. So A, that same thing that can be a motivator can make you afraid to act. Um, the second thing, and I think that this is really hard when you've been hurt by something in the way that Jews have been very badly hurt by white Christian supremacy, it can be really hard to see the ways in which you've benefited from it. So if you drop that word Christian, and you just think about whiteness, there's a real move in certain sort of European descended Jewish communities to say, no, Jews aren't white. And what they mean is, please don't erase centuries upon centuries of anti-Semitism, and there have been times in which Jews have been seen as racially other. And on the one hand, that's completely true. On the other hand, in the United States, legally, Jews have always been constructed as white. They've always been able to vote more or less. It's like the early history is a little bit complicated, but it's not a racial, it's not um, a racial uh, sort of restriction on voting. It's never been legal to in the United States to enslave a Jew because they're a Jew. They also have to be racially other. Um, but to use more contemporary examples, things like the GI Bill after World War II are really how many white Jews and Catholics entered the middle class. Um, and the GI Bill, which had to be passed through a Congress that was very dedicated in lots of ways, both in the South and in different ways in the North, to segregation in a way that wouldn't upset that apple cart. And so it wasn't available to Black and certain kinds of Brown veterans in the ways that it turned out to be available to Catholics and Jews. And so when Jews, out of a fear that anti-Semitism will be denied, also want to deny their whiteness. They deny some of the structural privileges that they have, and that can collapse the differences of how hard it is to get ahead, right? Like, and that can make you a really bad ally. And the last thing that I would say that happens in Jewish communities, and um, before I was a Jew, I was a Unitarian, and perhaps this is something that Matt can speak to um, as well, but um, I think when you self-identify very strongly as liberal or progressive, it can be very hard when people push against your self-image as being good at being liberal or progressive. So if I, as a person of color in either a Unitarian or a Jewish setting, want to push against racism, and often it's structural racism, or I'm South Asian, and so I'm wonderfully exotic, exotic, and people think that I should feel, find that like interest complimentary, and I don't, it messes with their very close, dearly held self-perception to be like, hey, wait a minute, maybe there's something here you need to learn. Um, because I think we have kind of a one drop rule around racism in the United States. You did one structurally racist thing and the distance between you and somebody burning a cross on a lawn and kind of emotionally collapses. And that need to self protect an identity can be a real obstacle to learning. Hi everyone. <clears throat> I want to piggyback on what my panelists said and echo the concepts of imagination and racism. I think one of the things that strikes me that's expressed by Muslims the most in this context, especially the community of those who recently immigrated or descendants of recent immigrants is Islamophobia. There's this fear with the community of confronting issues related to social justice in case it might expose weakness with Muslims or a deficiency, a perceived deficiency in Islam in a way that can perpetuate misunderstanding of the religion and further discrimination against those who follow it. Um, so this idea that Islam and Muslims are already vilified enough and Muslims can feel that any public handling of what can be considered an internal issue especially will add fuel to this fire. Um, and so in this context, um, one of the specific areas that I see it in my research is uh, when it comes to spiritual and sexual abuse, uh, in particular by those in leadership positions. And there's a common trope that we hear from victims that they have a fear of coming out publicly around these issues 
because they fear it will further perpetuate Islamophobia and tropes of Muslim men being necessarily violent and Muslim women necessarily victimized <clears throat> simply because they come from Muslim families or practice Islam. And while there are, of course, cases of spiritual abuse in all communities, including the Muslim one, the vast majority of Muslim leadership are you know, great and strong leaders. So this is kind of the context in which I hear a lot of resistance coming, um, especially from the community that I described. Thank you so much. Any panelists want to add any comments on this particular topic? Um, I would like to think then about what helps religious communities get involved in justice work. Um, I love this theme of imagination, um, of the presence of history. I think, Eric, you, you talked earlier about um, giving people models. Uh, so I, my question is this, um, what are some specific things that we can do to help religious communities um, have the courage uh, to do meaningful justice work. Seymour, do you wanna begin? Sure, I mean, I think that really having good resources and um, sort of roadmaps is very important. Um, I think that I'm thinking about Eric's comment at the beginning that people often know that there are things that they don't know. They also, when they forge ahead and try to do things, make mistakes because of things that they don't know. And then what you get is you get a situation in which someone was trying so hard and they end up, whether they're doing more harm than they would have if they sat still, they're doing harm. So for instance, I'm in a situation right now where kind of structurally with the best of intentions, some folks who didn't really understand either the racial politics of what they were getting into or sort of how academic politics work, recruited a bunch of scholars and have a situation where structurally a collection of people who are largely women of color are be being paid less to teach about racism than a group, a, a mixed but largely white group is being paid to learn about racism. This happened for lots of reasons. It didn't happen because anyone was awful or evil, but it happened because there were some sort of moments in the planning process where nobody thought, oh, what does it mean to have this led by white folks? And then when they tried to fix that problem, they didn't have a budget line for it, right? So they were juggling. And so I think having real resources and putting work into developing resources that are easily accessible and then promoting them and promoting them across religious lines right because different groups are going to get there in different moments and i think that you know part of what happens is religious groups are inherently siloed so it might be that like the baptists or the unitarians or the catholics or the muslims have good resources for this that the jewish colleagues that i'm thinking of didn't necessarily like think to look for right so how do you communicate how do you create sort of conversations so that people can learn from each other's mistakes? And how do you also cultivate a kind of, um, and this is where Loretta Ross um, of Smith College and of Sister Song talks a lot about instead of having a call out culture, having a call in culture. How do you help people learn from their mistakes and feel supported in taking the risks that result in making those mistakes without getting canceled because they screwed up when they had the best of intentions and were stretching themselves beyond what they could execute perfectly? I really like that. I really like the emphasis on giving people space to grow. Um, and having a spirit of generosity, knowing that we're probably going to mess up a lot and helping people um, feel okay with taking the steps that they are able to, to do. Um, if I could just offer a couple comments about what I've observed in my own work with relation to, with regard to refugee resettlement. Um, and I will add that I'm thinking about this as a scholar of refugee resettlement and advocacy, but also someone who, on the day I submitted my book manuscript on refugee resettlement, had my congregation uh, agree to help with a big refugee resettlement project in Indianapolis where I live. Um, one thing that's interesting is that refugee resettlement has never been popular in the United States ever. There has never been a majority in public opinion polls that 
expressed uh, a commitment or willingness to resettle refugees in the US going back to the 1930s up through the 21st century. So it's kind of a miracle that anyone is involved in refugee resettlement and any refugees at all get accepted in the United States. But one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is Eric's point about who is our neighbor. And one concern I've often had about the discourse of welcoming the stranger is the fact that a lot of the people who we are um, interacting with, at people who are refugees and immigrants are not actually strangers, but people we know. Um, and it is in fact relationships that has often motivated people to get involved in refugee work. Maybe they have a relationship with um, somebody who was in Vietnam that they had worked with during the war. And in the United States, they were horrified by what happened in the aftermath of the fall of Saigon. And therefore they got involved with um, refugee resettlement because they owed it to that person they know and love. We saw something similar in the aftermath of the fall of um, Afghanistan earlier uh, in, in the past summer. And so I think a commitment to uh, honoring the relationships and honoring and caring for the people we know is, is a big part of why people do this work. I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit um, to a theme that I think is really important for us to discuss. Um, when we put together the people for this panel, I, I wanted to bring together people who I think were very thoughtful about how to do public scholarship in a way that is engaging religious communities, but also we wanted to make sure we have different faith perspectives represented here. And uh, the, the religion scholar Kiati Joshi has written a really fantastic book called White Christian Privilege. Um, and I think it's worth us discussing how Christian normativity plays a part in engaging religious audiences for social change. Of course, we know Christian normativity shapes all of American life, um, including justice work. And I wonder if we could talk now about how increased religious diversity in the United States has changed the landscape of doing social justice work. So Nancy, I'd love for you to begin. Thanks, Melissa. And I think I saw Dr. Joshi and the participants. So that's exciting to have her on the, the panel with us here. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to start with is just a framing that I think is really important for all of us to understand when we talk about Muslims and Islam in the United States. Um, and it's a framing that's arguably a great strength, but it also leaves room <clears throat> for a lot of conflation and confusion in the US context. And as many of my colleagues here know, so many of this country's laws and policies um, and structures came to be with the assumption that religion is centralized and that its authority is primarily bureaucratic. The way that religion is protected, the way that it's recognized and assessed is based on the idea most often that there's a central authority that affirms that religion, who its leaders are, what its laws and rules are. Now, of course, as faiths emerge that lack this kind of centralized structure, bureaucrats at times try to amend the policy, policies and laws to accommodate these faiths, but it's still this forced fit. It's still this square you're trying to fit in a circ circular hole. Um, so all of this to say is that there is no unified Muslim voice or perspective nor any singular Islamic theology, nor any church equivalent in the Muslim community, especially here in the United States, where we have this imagined religious freedom and no state intervention that, that fills that role as happens in many of the Muslim majority societies. So as a result, when Muslims are split on an issue, none of them can really authoritatively claim that this is what Islam says or quote unquote, speak for Islam. That's just not something that's possible. That said, I'd be hard pressed to find any Muslim that would argue against the importance of social justice work, uh, no matter where they come from. That's just essential to so many of us. However, how you define social justice is heavily debated. And I think that's where we can see the biggest change in recent years, especially here in the United States. We have more Muslims who are emerging, who are setting aside the idea that they speak for Islam and instead focusing on basic human rights as social justice, even if those rights don't necessarily align with their own tenets or creed. It's very much in partnership with what we often hear today labeled as progressive politics. Then there are other Muslims who refuse to partner or work towards these causes because they find that it conflicts with their creeds. And we might see that label more um, aligned with what we call conservatism. 
Uh, so this is where we see a rising uh, importance of allyship, like allyship, allyship, allyship. We hear this often on so many fronts across the political spectrum. And this has really drastically increased post 9-11. Um, one great example in the recent past is the Women's March that focused heavily on the rights of marginalized groups across faith, race, gender, sexuality, and was co-led um, by several women, including one um, uh, Muslim woman in hijab, Linda Sarsour, who was on the cover of many different publications and magazines as one of the fo um, founders and leaders of this march. Uh, on a more local level, we see like in Missouri, there was a Jewish cemetery that was vandalized um, and the Muslim community started a crowdfunding campaign and raised over $100,000 to help restore that. So this understanding of the importance of allyship, of building really deep relationships with communities um, so that those relationships are present. So when something emerges, the, they're already there. They're already standing. We're not looking for relationships to solve crises, but a, a recognition that we need to be in relationship as marginalized communities, especially um, for these moments, I think has taken over, especially again, when I say with, with the immigrant and the recent immigrant community, because if we look at the Black Muslim community, I think they've, they're have they way ahead on the, the recognition of the importance of this kind of um, um, relationship building. The relationship piece is so very important, right? You'll remember that I noted that after the Squirrel Hill shooting, the Islamic Federation of Pittsburgh was right there and was right there because there were longstanding trusted relationships, right? Um, I think that another piece of, of what can be really important um, in terms of these marginalized groups, and then I want to return, I'm just like, I have some prepared thoughts, but I want to respond to some of what Nancy said because I think it's so vital, is to remember that when you're working together as marginalized groups, you don't necessarily all have the same sort of agenda and needs. And you have to maybe take a moment and step back and give a little bit. Um, Nancy brought up the Women's March and it was very, very present in my awareness, not the first Women's March, but the second one, that there were Jewish groups who because of the um, pro-Palestinian sort of focus of the group felt like they that was a place where they shouldn't be. Now, I'm going to take a moment to suggest that part of what happens when you make coalition politics is you don't get to call all of the shots, right? And I'm not saying here that every single Jewish women's group should have shown up in that moment. I think that that's where you have to decide, like, can I be in this coalition or can I not? But I think it's dangerous to set up a policy of having a litmus test, right? Um, that that is something where you need to think, and this is in the Jewish community, was very hard on Jews of color, who really, that is just not for many, many of, of us, the litmus test that we want, right? The, the question of Palestine. And for many younger Jews, that's not the litmus test that is appropriate because, because of, of differences in that community. And so you need to be prepared to work across distant difference and to say, I will make common cause where I can make common cause and that that has to be acceptable. Um, and, um, and I think that that's, that's a real piece of this. I also think there are places and times when it's important to assert difference. Um, and in this case, I'm thinking a lot about um, as we were planning, Matt talked about this concept that we have um, in sort of the Abrahamic faiths and particularly in Christian Jewish Alliance of a biblical mandate. And I think that this is where you see white Christian privilege. And though I am here representing American Judaism, both as a scholar and as a Jew, I'm actually gonna pass this off to my Baptist colleague because he's the Bible scholar. But to say like the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament are not actually the same document. And I think that when we try to create common language so that we can make common cause, if we don't sit comfortably with the idea that difference is acceptable, what we can end up, what we run the risk of doing is erasing the majority opinions and folding sort of, at least in the Jewish case, and I'm curious, Nancy, if this is true in the Muslim case as well, um, kind of running with the pieces that are acceptable to a Protestant majority or maybe a Christian majority. Um, and so Eric, I'm curious as to what you might think about that sort of piece of coalition building. 
Yeah, I think what what the this idea of white Christian privilege helps, I think, clarify and elucidate is the sense that in this work, we start with certain underlying assumptions that we think we all are agreed on, right? So whether it's we all are into biblical text or this text that we have is basically the same, right? So I think part of the challenge here, but also part of the opportunity is for com faith communities of all kinds of different religious stripes when they're interested in common work, that this calls for us to dig deep into our individual uh, faith commitments. Um, this isn't about, um, you know, it, it isn't about letting go of all our particularities in order to do work together, but how we hold those particularities. Can we hold them in a way that's uh, both uh, full of conviction and passion because these are the things that we believe, but loosely enough to know that my neighbor, the person I want to work with, the person I want to be in this allied relationship with, might see the world a very different term, starting in a very different place. So that openness then is vital. So it's both like this, the sense of where we've come from, from a Christian community or Muslim community, but a sense also that folks are coming from very different places as well. And just to kind of have a sense of generosity about those spaces strikes me as, as really important. The one thing I'll other say that this notion of allyship, I think is really sparked by my thinking here too, and that, um, that allyship doesn't just call for us to line up on the same side, there is a deeply relational piece that I might associate too with the sense of love of your neighbor, that to be an ally is not just to pat them on the back and say, I agree with you, but to love them precisely because there are ways in which our neighbor is alike to us and ways in which they are quite different. Uh, and that love requires embracing both of those. Yeah, if I can, if I can piggyback on that, I mean, I'm loving the, just like noting the language that we're all sharing, relationship, allyship, neighbor, love, I think that that all kind of lends itself to, to what you brought into the space, Eric, with the sense of like, congr like if religious congregations are going to engage in justice work, they have to be comfortable making mistakes, kind of learning from the communities that they're attempting to build relationships with. Um, and so, I, you know, in that spirit, I wanted to share, you know, some of the experiences that I have being part of an interreligious, interracial justice organization in Charleston, um, you know, uh, Samira alluded to it, but, you know, I think that that the ways we often think about Christian normativity and the way kind of Christian concepts structure space, I've kind of experienced in the Charleston area justice ministry, increasingly in the attempt of the organization to be more inclusive, the kind of assumption that we're operating with what could be called like a monotheist, monotheistic normativity or, or an Abrahamic normativity. So um, as um, you know, a coalition of Christian of Protestants and Catholics and becomes one of Christians and Jews and then becomes one of Christians and Jews and Muslims, there's a kind of assumption that, well, we are all different, but we are all motivated to the points that were already made, that we're all motivated by the same kind of impulse that perhaps comes from the Hebrew prophetic tradition that we all share or from um, you know, our sense of what the one God calls us to do. And first of all, as a member of a Unitarian congregation, this like really rankles the non-theistic Unitarians who like don't see their, you know, in many cases, like see justice work as why they're Unitarian, not you know, as something they do from some sort of kind of, you know, man mandate from the Bible. Um, and, uh, but I, I kind of see myself wearing two hats um, in that spirit of allyship of relationships. So when I'm kind of in my, you know, if I'm, if I'm wearing my hat as a leader in this organization, I'm often trying to push the organization to be more kind of self-reflective and inclusive of the ways they think, you know, we think as an organization of our religiousness, right? So that, you know, we're not excluding Buddhists, Hindus, non-theists, you know, a whole range of people who don't think of religiousness in terms of biblical mandates or even theism. But on the flip side, when the Unitarians come complaining to me, part of, you know, and, and I should say like our, our congregation is an overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly, you know, highly educated and affluent community, um, when the Unitarians come complaining about, well, you know, like, I wish they wouldn't talk about God so much, or I wish that, like, they would acknowledge that we don't have a biblical mandate, my message to them is, y'all, this is what it's 
this is what it means to be in allyship and relationship with other co with other organizations, right? Like it's it's a matter of recognizing that the vast majority of the black and white Christians, of the Jews, of the Muslims who are in this coalition, that is the language that speaks to their tradition. So it's kind of a, you know, I think that the messiness of this conversation is really great because I think that that's partly to Eric's, you know, much earlier point. Like, I think that's often a barrier for people uh, in, in engaging in justice work. But I think that that um, is inevitably what happens when, you know, real human beings do real human things <laughs> with each other. It's messy, it's complicated, and it's about learning. Thank you so much, Matt. I, I will add that as someone who uh, studies a community that doesn't always describe their beliefs and practices as religious, um, uh, I study Hmong Americans, um, and sometimes they describe their beliefs and practices as religious, sometimes they describe it as cultural, and there are really complex reasons why they might choose one or the other. But I think a, the, the Protestant assumptions that continue to animate what we designate as religious and not religious is just really important for us to keep in mind. Um, okay, I want us to shift focus just a little bit. And I think some of the things we've talked about already, I think lend us to this new direction, which is what it means to do public scholarship that explicitly intentionally engages in religious communities. So lots of times when we talk about public scholarship, we think about, for example, writing in, op-ed in the Atlantic, which Matt just did recently, or perhaps teaching um, a class to community members. We often don't think about engaging in religious communities when we talk about public scholarship. I'll, I'll say that, you know, maybe that feels that way to me because I'm coming from a big public university. It might look different if you're coming from a seminary, Erica, but um, I do want us to think about the work of doing public scholarship in a way that reaches out to faith communities. And so my first question is this, I'd like to know how all of you as public scholars have endeavored to engage in religious communities. Um, and I'd like for you to reflect on your practices and the principles that guide you when you do justice work and outreach to religious groups. So. Matt, I think you're a good person to start off with because you started talking about your uh, justice work in Charleston. Yeah, you know, the, so this, is, this is definitely of a theme with messiness, you know? We, we all wear, did so many different hats. Um, you know, I'm a, this is gonna get confusing y'all. So just, you know, hold on to your, your seats. I am a Catholic. I am a Catholic who happens to be a member of the Unitarian congregation for a variety of reasons. Um, I am a member of an interreligious justice coalition, right? And so which hat I'm wearing or which space I'm in determines what justice work looks for me at that moment. And, and as I was preparing for today, I was reflecting that, you know, the things that get labeled public scholarship, you know, in our, you know, promotion portfolios and, you know, our bios um, are probably the things I do the least amount of actually, right? I might have an essay come out like once every half year, I am trying to tweet a little less frequently uh, for a kind of spiritual discipline. Um, but like, you know, I am engaging, you know, multiple days every week in this justice ministry. Um, I'm a part of the racial justice coordinating team at my Unitarian church where, you know, we're really trying to press this overwhelmingly white congregation to really hold themselves accountable and, and grapple with what it means for this kind of white congregation to engage in anti-racist work within itself and in the broader community. Um, as, a unit, as a member of a Unitarian church, but someone who still self-identifies and practices as a Catholic, I'm also in other spaces kind of challenging white Catholics in particular, but Catholics more broadly as well to kind of reckon with the history of black Catholics, for instance, um, to reckon with, with the ways that, you know, to use Eric's term, Catholics have been misformed um, in terms of what it means to be kind of neighborly and Catholic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that if we did a pie chart, a lot of us, I imagine, like would have the bulk of our pie chart in our, in our local communities 
whether that's an, a congregation, an organization, you know, talks that you're giving at that public library that, um, you know, don't get tweeted out. Um, but um, that's, that's the bulk of, I think, our time spent on public scholarship, even though the academy often kind of, not just like disregards it, but like kind of denigrates it to the, you know, in contrast to other ways. Nancy, do you have any thoughts on this question? Yeah, I have a lot. So let me try to organize them. But, you know, the, my first job outside of college was as the only paid staff person on a coalition based um, citywide project called the Citywide Dialogues in Ethnic and Racial Diversity. It was located in Boston, Massachusetts, and it brought together a host of different um, religious and ethnic and racial institutions across the city to try to address racism in the city of Boston. And I was coordinating at the administrative level a lot of the work um, between all the different volunteers from the different orgs and organizing these. Um, and then I went from that to being a Muslim chaplain uh, at Wellesley College, where I worked for, for a number of years. Before I started academia, before I joined what we call the Ivory Towers. and. Um, while I was doing that community work, I was active in my um, my Muslim institutions and my mosque, and it was very soon after 9-11, so there was kind of this avalanche of public speaking at churches and synagogues and libraries and Girl Scout troops and schools and whatnot, like, what is Islam? What, who are these people? And I, would, I gave hundreds of these talks, and I would probably do it all differently if I knew what if I knew then what I knew now, but but all of this is to say that I started in the in the public space, and so then when I started doing this academic work in the beginning, it felt like they were they were separate, and I just couldn't reconcile that. I couldn't. I felt like it, you know it was like am I American or am I Egyptian or am I Muslim? Like the the identity crisis was happening at a professional level. Like am I an activist? Am I a scholar? And I the way I reconciled it personally is the way that I reconciled it professionally, which I had to find the harmony between them, um, and I insisted on that throughout. Uh, so one of the things that I've observed and here at Michigan is a great example. I'm involved in this public engagement fellowship, and there seems to be this this kind of two-pronged approach to public engagement. What we've mentioned here, I think Matt, you talked about this as like the kind of more standard one. Um, I'm gonna write an op-ed, something that's scholarship, but accessible in written form or in spoken form to a public audience. But then there's the like, my sleeves are rolled up and I'm engaged on the ground working with communities. And I don't think that academics necessarily recognize both as public academic scholarship, right? The, the former, like you were saying, is the more popular. Um, but both exist, and I think that's kind of where the movement is going, is how do we reconcile um, the academy to realize there's space for both of those. And so the project that I'm working on right now, I think is a great example through that public engagement fellowship. I partnered with a Muslim organization that investigates um, complaints of spiritual and sexual abuse in the Muslim community to try to create reports that are made available publicly um, for people to know about these instances as they're hiring and, and um, bringing in people into their community. And they had a case study that was a really great um, model to create a teaching tool from that can be used to offer best practices if an instance like this takes place in a community. What, how should a community respond? Um, what are the, the best approaches? What are the areas they should be concerned with? So we're working on that together. So I find, and we're, there's writing coming out of that, but there's also an, an actual case study that we're working on that will be workshopped in different um, Muslim spaces. So there are ways to collaborate, and I think that that's, that's where I see the academy going, but I, I'm a biased perspective. So this is all very exciting and it, it leads very nicely to my next question, which is this, what are the possibilities that are enabled by engaging religious communities? What can happen when we do this, do this well? Samira, or Samira, could you uh, respond to this, please? Um, I, um, I think, you know, the possibilities are really interesting and I think they have a lot to do with where you're located. I'm also at a big public university and so I think it's really true that the things that in my life, tenure and promotion file that get recognized as public scholarship are much more like the Atlantic article and much less, it's not that it's not 
giving a talk at a local synagogue. Um, it is maybe giving a talk at a local synagogue as a visiting scholar, but not being a member of a local synagogue that does a particular kind of work. And so in that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it does mean, you know, the hats that you're wearing are being juggled, right? You might have a vibrant kind of life that is apart from your professional life that has to do with your activist work, with your public service work, the things that, you know, one might call volunteering, um, but that is really vitally important. Um, and, and then you end up with questions like, you know, what happens when you end up in those settings and you've got a kind of scholarly expertise, but you're not there as the hired gun scholar. You're there as a member of the community who is, and not, maybe a lay leader, maybe not a lay leader, right? Depending on how much time and energy you have to put into that world. So like, first of all, there's a lot that is being negotiated and I think that's important. Um, I think another, but I think the potential is really building vibrant relationships between the university and the local community. One of my favorite things about my current job is that I'm sort of um, housed in the Department of Women and Gender Studies and the program in Jewish Studies. And I came here from a religious studies department um, at a private college that is a loosely affiliated with a religious organization, but not a seminary, right? Like sort of a church with more than historic connections to the United Methodist, or a, college with more than historic connections to the United Methodist Church, but in religious studies, I think for a variety of reasons, largely having to do with kind of complicated feelings about how religious studies is not theology, and I can answer questions about that, we all can later, um, there's sort of a, a hesitancy to say normative things. And in a women and gender studies department, I can say normative feminist things. I can say them in the classroom. I can say them in public spaces. I can say them as a scholar because we are in a department dedicated to um, equity across uh, genders and sexualities, right? As a member of the program in Jewish studies, which has a mandate to do public facing work, I am supported in doing that kind of work and there's a higher sort of recognition. And I think that those are models within the university that can be expanded on in other areas, right? What would it mean for religious studies departments to think more about public space facing work? What would that mean for other, for sociology departments, right? I think there's a lot of space there and, there, and there's movement and potential there. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, I'm in Colorado in a women and gender studies department. And so as you may know, um, women and gender studies in Wyoming, our neighbor to the north, was almost defunded. And it looks like that isn't what's happening, but it can kind of give the, the political moment that we're in can give a certain urgency to these things. And I think modeling with, um, working with local religious communities can provide models for other ways of working with kinds of local communities. Um, I do think that realistically, um, given some of the sort of pressures that the academy is under, folks are gonna need to think about like, am I trying to reconcile those two identities? Am I trying to do them separately? And institutions are going to need to think about how they value those things, right? It's not that there isn't possibility and it's not that it isn't important. It's that universities are better at recognizing things when they get glory. So Melissa, you were just nominated for like, what? A woman of the year for the state of Indiana? It's very exciting. The University of Michigan is gonna like that better than they like sort of the quieter work that you do, right? And there are lots of people who you work with who didn't get that honor. And I know that you're the first person to reflect the glory back on them, but you may not be able to reflect it strong enough for their institutions to value it, right? So there also has to be pressure to recognize that if we want those potentials to be realized. Thank you, Samira. I like that you brought up the theme of teaching and very briefly, I'd, I'd just like to share and also the theme of relationships between the university and religious communities. So for the past three years, I've had a, 
a grant from the Luce Foundation. Um, it's a collaboration between Princeton's Office of Religious Life and the Migration Refugee Service of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And they've worked together to um, study the intersection of religion and refugee resettlement. And we've used these oral histories that we've collected in studying this to create curriculum um, that can be used in religious communities. So it's this combination of relationship with different institutions um, and education in religious spaces. And I will add that there's something really special about teaching in religious spaces because I think that's often a place where people try to be their best selves or, or they're, they're encouraged to try to be better people. And so I think that people's guards are a little bit lower and they're more open to thinking about um, an issue, especially a very controversial issue like um, anything related to race or immigration or refugee resettlement in a new way, in a way that's more generous of spirit. So um, there are, of course, perils associated with this work. And earlier this year, I moderated a conversation with um, Kristen Cobb Dumay, um, Beth Barr, and Anthea Butler about the difficulty of doing scholarship that challenges religious communities. Um, and I wonder if we can talk about the perils and the challenges of doing this work, perhaps the personal toll that it might take, or in general, the difficulty. Um, what are some challenges you've encountered? Matt, why didn't you go first? I was I was looking to to my other brilliant and beautiful panelists. Um, I um, so I might have looked enthusiastic. Um, yeah, I, I'll keep it brief and I'd love to hear Eric's thoughts and, and others' thoughts. Um, but, um, at, you know, I, I'm partly, a, you know, I'm a scholar of Black Catholic history, but increasingly I've been working on uh, the history of white Catholic racism. Also connected to your work, Nancy, how that intersects, how the history of white Catholic racism intersects with cl Catholic clerical sexual abuse. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that when, Speaking as a, a white scholar um, of, you know, white Catholic violence, um, as you would maybe not be surprised to hear, that's something that a lot of white Catholics don't want to hear about, don't want to talk about, don't want to confront, or um, you know, want to compartmentalize as instances of people who aren't religioning right, instead of thinking about it as something that is, you know, something that institutions, communities, and individuals are complicit in and, and thus must be accountable to. So, um, you know, I think that that dealing, you know, with white Catholic violence and trying to educate white Catholics and white Unitarians and other white religious congregations, um, the resistance, you know, is often kind of direct. And it also, um, you know, though it obviously pales in comparison to actual violence, like it is exhausting and troubling and, um, you know, frankly, depressing to engage in that scholarship when you're spending hours, you know, reading through, you know, grand jury reports of sexual violence um, or letters, um, you know, from white Catholic racists. Um, so um, those are my two cents, but I'd love to hear others. I think yeah. One of the perils on my name, name sorry, Samira, that, that's related to this in some ways, I think is for, for those of us who are doing this public work in, in a minoritized body, so whether because of race or gender or a religious identity, that, you know, I often get invited into spaces that are already friendly to the kind of things I would teach them. So I'll forget that every once in a while, somebody will be in the room with hostility, no matter, like they knew what they were going to say to me before I got there. And I, the, the thing that happens to me often is I forget it's going to happen. And when it happens, it's like it's happened for the first time each and every time. So I think the, the peril of being putting yourself in public is then it's encountering these, these voices and then the weight of those voices in our ears, right? So one of the things that I think a lot of us struggle with is that we'll forget the 100 people who were really happy and really positive and really shaped by what we shared and that one person that one hostile person is the person that takes up room in our heads. That's a little bit what I was going to say. I think um, 
because I work largely in Jewish audiences and kind of because of what I sort of was saying about the ways in which Jewish oppression motivates Jewish activism, but also makes it hard to hear about the white privilege that many Jews have. It's not that there's one person who knew what they were going to say before I got there. They came in expecting to love everything I was going to say. And then I was trying to call them in. They felt called out, they lashed out. And that is something, um, it's probable that I can get better at calling people in, but it's also really hard to call people in when they're feeling defensive. And um, and also when they don't see, I, as, as I said, I get a lot of exoticizing, right? And, they, and so like you experience something as othering and they amend it as complimentary and now you've got a problem and they want the intent to be what matters rather than the impact on you. And so they, they double down. And, you know, I talk to lots of non-Jewish groups too, and I've learned that Jewish groups can hurt me, as can Unitarian groups, which is the tradition of my childhood, um, in ways that other groups can't. I spoke to the Episcopalians. I went in. I was a professional. The Unitarians can hurt me in the way that my, my family of origin can, and the Jews can hurt me in the way that my family of choice, my family, my like kind of uh, current family can, right? I have to go in and pray with you next week, or I kind of want to go in and pray with you next week after what you've just said to me. Um, I want to flag one other kind of concern, though. Um, you may have seen that there was sort of a brouhaha in Jewish studies about someone at the University of Washington. Her name is Leora Halpern. She is a fine scholar and a deeply decent person. And um, she had an endowed chair and an endowed position. And she signed a document um, about a year ago, along with many other Jewish studies scholars, and particularly scholars of Israel-Palestine, condemning, offering sympathy for sort of Jewish and therefore Israeli marginalization, but condemning Israeli behavior um, violence uh, against Palestinians. And she was, uh, the funding for her endowed chair and program were returned to the donor after donor complaints. Um, the university has put much of that back in place. Um, it's unclear to me whether they did that because 600 of her colleagues signed letters objecting to what had been done or not. Like I really, I don't know the inner workings of what happened. But it's important to remember that um, there are there can be really strong costs if you if you are in a position that is in some way, shape, or form public facing, and you speak out on an issue that is um, controversial, particularly if it's like in Jewish studies. I am talking about talking about Israel Palestine more than I am talking about really anything else. There can be really high professional consequences. Um, and we have just seen a particularly stunning example of that. And I'm really proud of the field for the ways in which they rallied around our colleague. But it was, I don't know her, I know her certainly, but I'm, we're not close friends. And so I don't know what that experience was like for her, but I can't imagine that it was not scary and painful and disappointing, as well as being a professional, just horrible blow. And so it's important to remember that there are real, there are real risks, personal costs when you push against your community. There can be professional costs when you push against your community. Thank you yeah. for that. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. I was just gonna quickly add, you know, I agree with everything my colleagues here said, and especially what Samita just um, ended with, because I think the, the biggest peril in this work is that it can fail. Um, it can backfire, there can be serious consequences, and that happens, but sometimes th those failures can transform to successes, but a lot later, after other events take place, and they can be a seed. So finding the fuel that can sustain you in the face of those failures, conversations like this that make you aware you're not alone, that this work has value, I think is really critical because failure is a part of this, part of this process. That's the type of wisdom that I think lends well as an introduction to our final question that we have planned. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. And I've already seen some lovely questions coming in through the Q&A 
function um, on Zoom. So thank you for that. Um, I guess my last question is this. What practical advice do you have for scholars who want to do public scholarship and work in engaging religious communities? Eric, I wonder if you could begin. Sure. Uh, just briefly, I think it's important to start really hyper local. I think for some of us, we imagine if we're not publishing in the New York Times, then we, we're not doing public work. Like there's, but there's a lot of space in between that and, and developing those local networks and that local support, I think is really vital. Second is the importance of translating our scholarly work into these spaces, not because people are incapable of understanding us, but because they do other things with their everyday life that, that we scholars do differently. So it's about all those jargon shortcuts that we have and just explaining things uh, in a way that's accessible to very smart people who do very different things with their everyday life than we do. Uh, and last and most importantly, I think is um, to expect to learn stuff. Just because we're the experts in the room doesn't mean that we're the only ones teaching. Um, I have learned so much uh, from uh, everyday folks who aren't scholars, who aren't biblical scholars, who don't do this every day, but who have incredible insight uh, into their own faith, into the shape of the world. So uh, this is a two-way street where we benefit a great deal. We can learn a lot. So there's that peril of, of the hostile person in there, but even greater is the gift of someone who's lived a long and full life and can teach us something we wouldn't have otherwise learned. I love that. We can all be learners. We can all be teachers. Um, Nancy, do you have any practical advice? I, I'm just going to reiterate things that I've said that are important. One, developing relationships because we're human and because we should be in relationship with those around us and not because we're trying to solve a crisis or put out a fire that just that that just um, emerged. Um, and then taking care of yourself. Like I mentioned fuel just a few minutes ago, but finding whatever it is to keep yourself balanced, to find the sources that give you the drive and ability to sustain this work, I think is really important. Um, and recognizing that there will be battles uh, along the way, but that's a, that's a part of the process and knowing how to recover from them is really important. Matt and Samira, do you have any practical advice to share? I was going to offer one thing um, that would, in classic academic fashion, subvert some of the, ex the, the assumptions of this conversation. You know, I think that going back to the first comment I, I had about, you know, we think religion and social justice, we think of the civil rights movement. Um, I think we often wrongly assume that justice work is inherently religious um, and that it always has been. Um, and I think that, you know, if we think about the Black Lives Matter movement, which is the most significant and sustained racial justice movement of the past half century, that was precisely one that not just inverted, but like intentionally subverted some of the Christian male centric logics of this, of some of the parts of the civil rights movement, right? So it was founded by black women, two of whom identify as queer, all of whom kind of are differently religious, if not religious at all. Um, and so one of the things I'm often trying to challenge, especially Catholics, um, but other religious folk is that, you know, part of what it means to enter into and engage in justice work is to not assume that your religious community or your religious tradition has all the answers. Um, to sometimes listen and follow those who've already been doing the work rather than ask, you know, like what, you know, what is our job to do? So, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, to take the examples I'm most familiar with, a lot of Christian communities have been brought into racial justice work by the Black Lives Matter movement, not the other way around, right? So it's not that it was, you know, black and white Christian communities that were like launching a movement for, for racial justice, it was quite the opposite. It was, you know, young people in the streets were literally rising, you know, across the country were rising up and saying, um, you know, you, you know, this community, you know, has failed us, and the society has failed us. So I think that, you know, not to subvert, you know, to, well, to, to do a little bit of subversion and say that, you know, it sometimes also means religious communities need to um, engage in coalition building and listening and allying to organizations that, yes, may 
not hold the religious assumptions of your communities and in fact may challenge those assumptions right um you know which uh, you know there are a number of questions hopefully we can get to them about um how the lgbtq community intersects with you know religious kind of justice initiatives which i think is really important the black lives matter movement is a really incredible example of one that i think is challenging religious communities as much as it challenges um, kind of broader kind of white supremacist stru structures in their societies. This is, I want to echo something. I mean, first of all, I agree with Matt. I, I'm, I'm right there with Matt's subversion of the, of the concept here. But I want to echo something that Eric and Nancy said about relationships. And I think um, I'm sort of an extreme example of this, but I had a decade in my life where I moved every single year, bar one. So I moved nine times in 10 years. Uh, Nancy doesn't know me personally, but Matt, Eric, and Melissa are all nodding because I cried a lot. But what that means is that the hyper-local is really hard in those contexts, right? So I think it can be really hard to balance because it's also really important when you come into a community to listen, to do the listening and learning that Matt just talked about in your hyper-local context. So I'm in a place where I do far more work on sort of the national coalition level in sort of in my particular Jewish movement, or mo because I have these relationships that are scattered all over the country, I happened to arrive in Denver right in time for the pandemic. And so I'm building relationships here, but it means that my work isn't local. So I think that Eric is correct, but I also think that that can be a particular challenge at spots in your academic career. And not that it's it's probably counterproductive to beat yourself up for that, right? And you kind of need to accept where you are in what you're up to. Um, so I want to flag that. I also just sort of want to flag that this work, I think you have to keep your eye on the long game, right? And Nancy said that when she echoed, when I sort of told the story and she was like, you know, the bad thing can lead to a good thing, but it can take a really long time. And so I think it's very important, like not a self-care and a sort of um, wellness culture, get massages, not that massages aren't wonderful, if you can afford them and they're your thing, get massages. But like self-care in really robust ways, if you're a spiritual practice kind of person, develop a spiritual practice, attend to the communities that care for you. Um, think about those things because this work can be hard and depending on how you're doing it and what's happening as you do it, it can be lonely. Um, it doesn't have to be lonely, but it can be. And so really think about, think about yourself as a marathon runner um, who occasionally sprints, but not, but as someone who needs to care for themselves for the long haul and think really robustly and seriously about what that kind of care means. Excellent. So we have um, 12 minutes and we have some really fantastic questions in the Q&A. Because Matt gestured to, to it already, I'd like to begin with a question that is about people of faith and the LGBTQ community. There have been at least three questions on this topic already. So um, definitely a, an issue that is of concern to our audience and, and to all of us here. Um, so there is um, often great tension between conservative people of faith and supporting the LGBTQ community um, in the words of the person who posed this question. In today's world, I feel like the LGBTQ community is one of the few social groups that still face rejection under the idea that accepting this group goes against religious beliefs. Um, there are a couple other questions, but maybe I'll just center the discussion on this. What are strategies to bring folks of faith into movements to support the LGBTQ community who would like to address that i don't know if i have strategies but it's something that i have seen in the interreligious organization that i'm a part of um, and it gets back to some of the questions or issues that samira and eric and others raised earlier about what we imagine what collective communities imagine justice to be about um, so for the Unitarian Church, broadly conceived, but my local church, um, LGBTQ inclusion and advocacy for and, you know, fighting on the behalf of the LGBTQ community is understood as fundamental to what it means to be engaged in justice work. Um, and, and that, and our church here has kind of like served as a home in that regard. 
um, a safe space for those communities for a long, long time. Um, that is that is not the case for some of our allied organizations who are in a coalition dedicated to making the low country a more fair and equitable community, but who for a variety of reasons, theological conservatism being one of them, uh, you know, don't understand that to be a justice issue at all. Um, and I've been present at really interesting moments where the rubber really hits the road on coalition building, where a reformed rabbi offers a prayer for among a litany of things, LG, the LGBTQ community from the pulpit of a theologically conservative Christian space um, that causes conflict among ministers. And, and I got to be there for the, the evaluation meeting afterwards where all of these Christians are debating among, are kind of fighting amongst themselves about the extent to which, um, you know, basically trying to convince this one person who was upset by the prayer that um, that this is precisely what it means to love one's neighbor is to, to um, you know, be advocating for the LGBT community. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a strategy. I, I just, I think that this is, this is, you know, these are the really, you know, when we talk about it being messy and about kind of learning, like this is like a really important thing because I think that a lot of folk, a lot of congregations engage in coalition building with the assumption that what they take to be justice is what other people take to be justice. Um, and a lot of the time that's true. Um, and also a lot of the time that's not true. And you only find that out when you're in relationship with communities. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I, I was really um, happy to see those questions in the comments and, and was happy that we could have some time to, to say something about that. I think another place where it might be like another thing that's important to think about here I was just uh, gave a paper at Notre Dame and Tom Tweed reminded me that we tend to think about like the different religious organizations but there's an entire trend in the study of religion to think about the progressive P wings of the religions and the conservative wings of the religions and I think that's a helpful distinction right there isn't a Certainly there isn't a Protestant view because Protestants schism really, really well. Um, but there isn't a Jewish view, there isn't a Muslim view. It's really tempting to think that there's a Catholic view because there's such centralized authority. There isn't a Catholic view, right? There, there isn't like agreement among Catholic clergy, never mind the Catholic laity. Um, and so to, to do two things, right? And one is to not argue with LGBTQ folks about their experience of a religion by saying, no, that isn't what Judaism, Islam, the Baptists, the church thinks. That may not be what you think. That may not be what your community in that tradition thinks. That doesn't mean that they didn't experience and have the pain that they had. And that doesn't mean that they're not processing it and making the choices in ways that are right and authentic for them. But also to remember that your closest shared value people might in a lot of ways be your fellow progressives and not the fellow members of your tent, right? I have a lot more in common in terms of values with probably everyone on this call than I have with certain other communities in American Judaism. Right, and that's just sort of a given. One of the first, the first personal conversation I ever had with Eric, I asked him what kind of Baptist he was. And he asked if I had concerns about what kind of Baptist he was. And actually I was getting, wanted him to diagram Baptists for me, but like, yeah, I did, right? Like I absolutely had concerns. And that's the kind of place where you can only feel people out in relationship. That's how you do it. But you need to remember that you need to feel out your own community as well. And, and you need to then sometimes you have a responsibility to protect your, your, um, your allies, right? Like I'm, I'm not queer. I hope that I'm good at being a queer ally from some of my Jewish co-religionists. It's my job not to lie to them about what's there, but to do my best to be a firewall in the same way that white Jews do not lie to me about racism within Jewish communities, but help be a firewall when I experience it. We have time for one more question and I'm, um, we have lots of fantastic questions, but I'm, I'm gonna choose the one that was posed first in the 
Q&A function, which is about the relationship between social justice movements and ecclesiastical leadership, or I'd say broadly religious authority. Um, so is it a common phenomenon that social justice movements within faith traditions often happen in spite of ecclesiastical leadership rather than with it? So what's that relationship? And I'd like to um, give the floor to Eric or Nancy first, if they have any comments on this. I'm happy to say something briefly, unless Nancy, if you want to go first, I'm happy to. Okay, great. Um, one thing that, that comes to mind, um, the Princeton Seminary, seminary had, uh, we developed a, a slavery audit to think about the relationships that the seminary has had to slavery and its history. And one of the big insights that emerged for me in that is um, the number of students who, um, I think as many as 15% of our students yeah, back in the 19th century were abolitionists not because of the things they were taught here by their professors, because none of the professors here were abolitionists back then, but precisely in spite of what they were taught at the seminary. And I think about that today for myself too, as a teacher, what are the things that my students are gonna do despite the things I teach them? Because I'm a flawed person and I will teach them ways in ways that I will regret one day. It's just part of, part of the work. So I think it's important for us to, to find ways that even in the, within these institutional structures, that there are ways uh, pathways, uh, values that says there are folks who are going to be on the margins of this community, whether leader or lay, whether folks with names we know or people that we don't know who are going to be leading this community towards justice. Um, and it's going to be a minority voice. So how can we incline institutions, incline leadership to not just see those people making trouble out in the margins, but that precisely where trouble is being made is where transformation and justice might be blooming most. So I'm gonna keep my answer US centric because I think that's what we've mostly been talking about and because it gets very complicated once we step outside the borders of this country. But the vast majority of Muslims in this country don't have any ecclesiastical leadership. Um, there's no central recognized anything. And I think um, that means the answer is that almost all social justice movements happen um, despite despite the existence of one. With that said, there's still a fraternity, and fraternity is the, the right word here, of of Muslim men who are seen as, as leaders and authorities who have public platforms, who are looked to um, for, for rules and for guidance and, um, uh, and understanding. And so I think because there's an absence of a formal body that ordains, uh, you do see a lot of social justice work that happens around this leadership and critique of this leadership that can take place. Um, and we, you know, we talked about call out and call in before, but both taking place um, in sometimes public and sometimes private arenas. So it's all there. Thank you so much. Well, um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Before I hand it over to um, Dr. Colquitt to talk about some last minute uh, housekeeping issues, I just want to um, say thank you to the panelists and also I identify the fact that there are many more religious voices who could be part of this conversation who weren't. Um, this is both the beauty, the possibility, and the peril of doing a conversation about religious life and social justice. Um, how can we be more inclusive? It's hard when we only have um, space for a handful of people. So I just want to um, note that this conversation could have looked really different if we'd had a Buddhist and a Hindu um, and a a non-religious person participating in this conversation. Um, but I am so thankful for all of your thoughts and uh, practical bits of advice. Thank you to all of you. So Dr. Colquitt, do you have any final thoughts? No, I, I really just wanted to thank, the, thank you, uh, Dr. Borja for moderating and you the panelist. Uh, thank you everyone for your time, this very engaging conversation and for the work that you're doing to inform knowledge and action and addressing racism in religious contexts. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thanks to our NCID event production team and 
to you for joining this conversation today. Please help us out by completing the brief anonymous survey that should pop up in your browser after the after this event ends. We encourage you to continue the conversation on Twitter and stay uh, stay tuned for future events. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you so much, panelists. This was wonderful.